great pleasure to introduce um, Fernando Hartwig again for his third talk in three weeks, which feels like he's setting some kind of IEU visitor <laughs> record for the number of talks. Um, I'm hoping that the Zoom call can hear me as well at the moment. Um, yes, so um, yeah, uh, Fernando um, is from the, the, the Federal uh, University of Pilotus, where he's currently an assistant professor in epidemiology and a permanent researcher at the postgraduate program in epidemiology and also holds an honorary research fellow position here at Bristol. Um, his research interests are related to the field of causal inference in epidemiology, uh, with an emphasis on empirical and methodological work on instrumental variable analysis. Uh, he's also interested in translation of statistical methods between different fields of epidemiology, and his talk today is the no simultaneous heterogeneity, NOSH assumption for average causal effect estimation by instrumental variables. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone, again. Third time. During this visit, you have to bear with me a little bit more. Uh, so um, I, I'm actually a little embarrassed by this because by the title, it sounds something really fancy, really complicated, and it's actually something very simple. So hopefully we, you will all agree with me by the end of, of the presentation. So the structure of uh, my talk today is divided into four topics. In the first part, I'm just going to remind everyone about the core uh, assumptions that we need for a variable to be classified as a, as a valid ID. Then discuss a little bit about the issue of point identification in IV analysis. Then introduce what we have been calling the NOSH assumption, which relates to this issue of point identification. And then just some final comments uh, at the end of the presentation. So just to uh, hopefully remind everyone of the criteria that we need for uh, an IV to be considered valid. And here I'm going to use the following notation. Z is my IV or my candidate IV. X is my exposure, risk factor, treatment. Y is my outcome or response variable. And U are just some unmeasured common causes of X and Y, and because U is unmeasured, then we have confounding, and you cannot deal with that you know, con with conventional methods such as regression. So for Z to be a valid IV, we need the sort of three core conditions of statistical dependence between Z and X. Doesn't mean that Z needs to cause X, they just need to be somehow correlated. Independence, so there is no sort of backdoor paths between Z and Y, or we can think about this as sort of random assignment of Z with respect to Y. Um, and also the exclusion restriction criteria, which you know just means sort of no off-target effects of Z on Y. And by off-target, I mean that there is no effect from Z on Y that is not fully mediated by X. And you know, wh why do we care about that? Why do we care about, <laughs> I think people should uh, mute them, their, their, their mics. So wh why do we care about this? Why do we care if Z mets those conditions or not? Because if, uh, if Z met uh, meets those criteria, then we have the following uh, situation where Z is associated with Y, only if X causes Y. So we can use association between Z and Y as a means of studying or understanding causality in the association between X and, and, and Y, of course, if those assumptions hold. And so, okay, let's say we have a valid IV in the sense that Z satisfies those three criteria. So what does, this IV allows us to do. It allows us to test if X causes Y by simply testing the association between Z and, and Y, which is good because you know all we can hope to do empirically is to test associations directly. Uh, but notice that this is a question of X causes Y or not, right? Another than if X increases Y or decreases Y or by how much. And often we want to know that. We want to quantify the magnitude and the direction of the causal effect of X on Y for you know, our results to be useful in practice 
such as, you know, we know, need to know the direction. So we know if the treatment is harmful or beneficial, for example, and we want to know the magnitude of the causal effect so we can compare, for example, the causal effect that we are observing for this treatment or this exposure with the causal effect from another treatment or another exposure, right? So the conclusion here is that although the core IV assumptions are necessary for point identification, and I say point identification, I mean precisely this, estimating the magnitude and direction of the causal effect. They are necessary for this, otherwise like the Z is not a valid IV, but they are not sufficient for this. That is, we need additional assumptions on top of the three core IV assumptions for us to be able to get a, 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 a point estimate. That is interpretable. I mean, you always get a point estimate if you run the, the analysis, but how do you interpret that? So let's, let's talk a little bit uh, about this. So just so we can uh, you know, all speak the same language, I just want to introduce some very quick notation. Um, just, you know, this is just a notation of potential outcomes where, where I'm representing here y parenthesis x equals zero x. That's what, what I mean by that is the potential outcome when I assign individual y to, to, to treatment level little x, okay? If we're talking about a binary treatment, for example, little x can be zero or one. If we're talking about a continuous treatment, then x can take infinitely many values, and so on and so forth. Now that you have this notation, we can define individual level treatment effect, which I'm gonna call beta y through all the presentation. And that's just the difference between the two potential outcomes. The potential outcome when the individual is assigned to receive the treatment or the exposure, minus the potential outcome corresponding to the situation where the individual was assigned to not receive the treatment or the exposure, right? Assuming a binary treatment, yeah. okay? And of course, it is impossible to measure this directly for uh, individuals because we only observe one of the two potential outcomes for a given individual. And that's, this is the fundamental problem of causal inference. And that's why we always going to need some sort of assumption to you know, go about trying to do causal inference. And similarly, we can define the individual level instrument effect, which I'm going to denote as beta x, as the same thing, but instead of y, I have x, and instead of x, I have z, z right? So it's just the effect of z on x in a given individual, right? Uh, and again, I'm assuming a binary uh, <laughs> for simplicity. <laughs> you could uh, people mute their mics, please. Thank you. And again, this is also impossible to measure directly for the same reason as in the case above. Uh, and just, just to clarify for the conclusions that we are going to arrive at the end of the talk, it, it is not necessary for Z to be a causal instrument. Uh, and it doesn't have to be binary as well. I'm just assuming those things because it's easier to present the ideas. So yeah, perhaps the notation presentation wasn't so quick after all, because we have some more notation here in the slide, but you know, just bear with me a little bit more. Uh, now I want to talk about compliance, what I call compliance type. People have given different names to, to this idea. But the, the, the idea here is that Z can affect X in different ways in different people, right? So we're talking about a binary instrument and a binary exposure. We can have compliers, which are those individuals where if they receive the, if they, let's say, receive the instrument, they have the exposure, but if they don't receive, they don't have the exposure. The fires is the opposite. And always takers, you're always gonna have the exposure no matter what, and never takers is the opposite, right? So we have, those are the two possible sort of types of effects that Z can have on X. And this relates to this idea of heterogeneity in the effect of uh, X, of Z on, on X uh, in the population that we are studying. So now that we have this notation, we can finally define the estimate that we're going to be uh, looking at throughout the presentation. Uh, 
So this is just like the, the conventional IV estimate for the case where we have a binary instrument and then a binary uh, exposure. And I'm going to call the vault estimate W just for you know short. And this is you know sort of a textbook the uh, you know definition of this of this estimate. This is this is true, of course. But what I'm on a, what I want you to, to call your attention to is that if we translate this notation of compliance behavior to the notation that we defined previously on beta y and beta x, we arrive at a definition of the vault estimate that it is essentially a weighted average of the uh, individual level causal effects among compliers and among defiers. And notice that Always takers and ever takers do not contribute to this vault estimate at all, which makes sense because the instrument does not affect the exposure in those subgroups. So they just have no weight in the analysis. So sort of take home message of this slide. The vault estimate can be interpreted for the case of a binary instrument and a binary exposure as a weighted average uh, of the sort of average causal effect within compliers and the average causal effect within defiance, right? So just keep that in mind. The value estimate is, in, is a weighted average of conditional average causal effects. Okay, so now that we have this notation, we can talk about this, the so-called IV4 assumptions. The four comes from the fact that we have three core IV assumptions. So the additional assumptions on top of those are going to be IV4 assumptions, right? Uh, and those assumptions are uh, assumptions that allow us to point identify. When I say point identify, I mean, we have the result that comes out of our uh, valid estimator and we can interpret what that means. There are different IV4 assumptions and each one of them uh, identifies different causal parameters. And there are, you know, uh, here are just some common examples of IV4 assumptions homogeneity in the XY effect, or we, some people call this homogeneity in the second stage, thinking about two stage least squares. Homogeneity in the Z, Z, ZX effect, some people call this homogeneity in the first stage, and also monotonicity in the X on Y effect. We can also think about monotonicity in the Z on X effect, and so on and so forth. So there are many different IV force. Um, let's think about homogeneity assumptions for now. Focusing first on homogeneity in the second stage, that is homogeneity in the effect of X on Y. When I say that this, I mean that the effect of X on Y is exactly the same across everyone in the population that we are studying. So that's what I mean by homogeneity in the X on Y effect, right? So, you know, for all individual level causal effects, they are all equal to some constant C, okay? So under this assumption, and in the case where we have, you know, binary instrument and binary exposure, which is the case that you're discussing here, I claim that we can, that the valid estimate identifies the average cause effect. What is the average cause effect again? Is the average of all the individual level cause effects in the population. Right? So for the value um, estimate to be equal to the average cause effect, we need to be able to plug in stuff in the formula and get, and get out the definition of the average cause effect again. So if we do that, um, we're gonna we, we're gonna get it, and I, I have the derivation here, but I don't want to bother with that. I want to think intuitively about this. We just discussed a few slides ago that we can interpret the valid estimate as a weighted average of the average causal effect in compliers and the average causal effect in the defiers, right? But under homogeneity, those two are the same, and if I do a weighted average of the same two numbers, I'm gonna get this number back again, right? So that's just the sort of simple intuition why homogeneity in the XY effect allows us to identify the average cause effect, okay? Uh, 
let's now think about homogenating the first stage, homogenating the effect of Z on X. Uh, and again, we have, you know, I, I, again, we have the conclusion that the valid estimate is identical to the average causal effect. And uh, the reason is pretty simple. If the effect is the same across everyone in the population, then either everyone is a complier or a defier, right? So when I condition my uh, average causal effect here on the, uh, on the valid estimate, there is actually no conditioning in that particular population because everyone belongs to that group. So we just like immediately get the average causal effect. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that under the setting that we have been discussing so far, if you have homogeneity in the first stage or homogeneity in the second stage, then you're gonna able, you're gonna, then your valid estimate is gonna equal the average cause effect. Okay, that's the sort of take home message up to this point of the presentation. And we have monotonicity as well, but it's not really relevant to the context of this talk. I have this slide here. People can look at it if they want to, uh, you know, YouTube or whatever it is going to be uh, uh, uploaded to. Um, let's focus our attention to the average growth effect. Like the sort of general, sorry, the average cause effect in the population. So, or you know, the, the average of all the individual level cause effects in the population we are studying. Let's say that this is our target estimate. I'm not saying this is always going to be our target estimate. I'm just saying that for the purpose of the presentation, this is our target estimate. We saw that the valid estimate is identical to the average cause effect if we have homogeneity in the first stage or in the second stage, at least one of those two formulas of homogeneity. But if you think about it, those two assumptions are quite strong. You're assuming that the instrument affects the exposure in the exact same way for everyone in the population, or that the exposure affects the outcome in the exact same way in everyone in the population. We are not allowing for any sort of variability in the individual level effects, right? That's quite strong. And I mean, if that's what we need, then that's what you have to, to, to assume, I suppose. It may not be very plausible. And, and, and the idea here is to try to answer the question, are there weaker assumptions that is weaker than homogeneity that allows us to identify the average cause effect? So that's the question. And now we arrive at the uh, notion assumption. And for the case where Z is binary and X are binary, so the two are binary, uh, the Nash assumption is very, very, very simple. Very simple. We are just assuming that individual level effects of Z on X are independent of individual level effects of X on Y. So the first stage effects are independent on, on the second stage effects. That's the, the assumption, right? And that's why it has this name, no simultaneous heterogeneity. And um, the implication of this assumption is that the conditional uh, average causal effect, when we condition on the individual level causal effects, is just equal to the average causal effect because those two things are independent. So that's just, it just follows from the independence assumption. And again, we go back to our good old definition of the valid estimate and what is the valid estimate again? Is the is a weighted average of the conditional average cause effects, the average cause effects among compliers and the average cause effect among compliers. We um, the fires. We do a weighted average of those. But by this assumption of independence, the average cause effect among compliers is just the average cause effect in the population as a whole, and the same for the fires. So again, we have the same number and we're taking a weighted average of the same number and therefore we just get out the same number. So, you know, it's just, it's just that. I mean, it's a very simple thing if you think about it. Um, and the simplest way to think about it, in my opinion, is if we understand that the valid estimate is a weighted average 
but the weights are not correlated with what's being weighted. So it, it just, you know, it just converges to a simple average, which is the definition of the average cause effect to begin with. Okay. Is that is that clear? Okay, good. So let's try to understand this a little bit more. Uh, not only from this statistical perspective of you know those two things are independent and you know then you have that result, but what what does it mean for those things to be independent? Let's try to think about that. The first and obvious thing is that there must be no common effect modifiers of the of the effect of z on x and the effect of x on y. If they have common effect modifiers. Those the individual level cause effects on ge in general will be will be dependent. And the second condition, which is you know, pretty much follows from the first one, it, it could be um, you know uh, sort of merged with the first one if 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 you want to, is that we have if we have effect modifiers of z and x and effect modifiers of x on y, they, not, they, they may not be the exact same thing, but if they are dependent, then you're still going to have a problem, right? And so perhaps someone could ask, OK, you still need some assumptions, right, that are quite difficult to you know, assess empirically. Uh, yes, but the, the point is that this assumption is necessarily weaker than homogeneity because the homogeneity uh, requires no effect modifiers whatsoever. And here we are allowing for effect modification to happen, but in a constrained way. So that's why NOSH is weaker than homogeneity. So, uh, we, we, we just said that they, they, those two effects, they cannot have common, you know, common cause, essentially. But that does, that does not mean that, say, modifiers of the effect of Z on X, that does not mean that they cannot be causes of Y. They can be causes of Y. They, they just cannot modify the effect of, of X on Y. So we can have confounders that, for example, modify the, the ZX effect. We can have that. But then those confounders cannot modify the XY effect. And the same the other way around. If we have confounders that modify the XY effect, then those confounders cannot modify the ZX effect. So this is just, it's a very, it's a very messy sort of slide, but let's, let's try to understand what, 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 what the message that, that I want to communicate here. Here we have U1 to U6, which is just a partition of our U, of our set of unmeasured variables, right? And look at U6 first. U6, we are claiming that it modifies the ZX effect, and it modifies the xy effect. Okay. So if we have a variable that behaves like u6, then NOSH is going to be violated because they have a common effect modifier. Right. So for NOSH to be valid, we must assume that u6 is empty. There is no variable that you know could be classified as u6. And you know some other restrictions uh, should be applied as well, uh, which relates to my previous discussion that confounders, so common cause of x and y, that modify one of the effects cannot modify the other. One thing that is important to keep in mind is that uh, in our discussion, because because we are focusing on the valid estimate and in a sort of uh, definition of the average cause effect that is based on the difference between the two potential outcomes. So we're thinking about linear scales here. Uh, 
that the individual level effects, both the first stage and the second stage are defined in the additive scale, right? Uh, which might seem, you know, okay, just, just the scale, but it, it actually has some implications. Because if we have non-additive data generating models for X and Y, then it's, it's going to be very unlikely that Nosh holds. And the, the, the issue is that such models are often what we think are more plausible for cases when we have binary variables, right? When, when you have binary variables, you often think that they were generated by some sort of, I don't know, log something, right? So, um, and, and, and th this is true even if the right-hand side of, of the model that generates, say, X or, or Y, does not include product terms because this is a, it's an issue of scale. When I have a model that is defined on, say, a multiplicative scale, and I sort of try to go back to the additive scale, um, it's very unlikely that I'm not going to have uh, a factor modification in the, in the linear scale, in the, in the additive scale. And I mean, this is just an example of, of, of it. Uh, I, I won't go through it in, in detail during the, during the presentation. You can stare at it uh, in YouTube if, if you want to later. But for, for now, just, just believe me that we have you know, a model for the expectation of X given our instrument and a measure variable that will be our confounder, you know, just sort of three parameters and very simple sort of multiplicative model. And similar thing for the expectation of Y, but instead of Z, we have X. And here in this, in this model, we don't have uh, effect modification in the multiplicative scale. If you take, so say the log, just is going to be adding stuff, right? But when we try to go to the uh, additive scale, then we're going to see that the effect of uh, z on x is going to depend on, on u, and the same for the effect of x on y. So we're going to have, you know effect modification by u in the additive scale when you go from when we start from multiplicative and go to additive. Uh, and there is we have been focusing on the case where the exposure is binary, right? Let's try to expand this a little bit. Let's consider the case where x is continuous. If x is continuous, then the individual level effect of X on Y can vary, you know, according to unmeasured factors like we have been discussing so far, but also with, according to X itself, because we're thinking again, we're thinking about additive scale. So let's say that this, um, that a curve there describes the effect of, of X on Y, it is some sort of uh, quadratic relationship. So we can clearly see that the slope of the curve depends on where you are in terms of the value of x, right? For individuals that have the value of x more or less like here, the effect is pretty much zero. Individuals that have low values of x, the effect is negative. And individuals that have uh, higher, level, higher values of x, the effect is, is positive. So the individual level effect of x on y varies according to, to x itself, and you know, this will be basically because the derivative changes uh, according to, to x, right? Um, and the implication of this is that we could have a path in our DAG that is um, that, you know, an arrow that starts at x and points to uh, beta y, which denotes the individual level causal effect of x on y. And the problem here is that in this DAG that we arrived at previously by imposing the conditions that we need for NOSH to hold, now NOSH no longer holds because they have a path such as, you know, uh, beta x, z, x, and, and beta w. So beta x and beta w are no longer independent, even though they don't have, you know, common 
effect modifiers and, and all that stuff because this sort of the possibility of non-linearity in the effect of, of X on Y. On so when this happens, then Nash is going to be violated pretty much always. And there are sort of two ways, two apparent ways to fix it. In one of them, we just assume that the effect of X on Y is linear. That's going to be plausible in some scenarios are not going to be that plausible in some other scenarios. Uh, it doesn't have to be constant across everyone in the population, it just has to be linear. So, you know, the relation, the effect of X on Y can be described, say, by a line like this for a given individual, by a line like this for a given individual. So the lines can change, but they all have to be lines. They, none of them can be, say, curved or whatever. Uh, and the apparent the second solution is to assume that the effect of Z on X varies only stochastically. There is, it has no sort of, you know, um, it's not affected by any, any variables that I'm showing here on, 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 on the DAG, just by some exogenous variable that does not need to be shown on the DAG. However, only the first option is valid. Only assuming that X on, well, the effect of X on Y is linear is a valid solution to this problem. Well, and the reason to try to understand why, why this is the case, we can consider the case where, where Z is a multivalued IV. So now we are leaving the scenario where we had the binary at V and going to scenario where I have a multivalued IV, not a continuous one, just multivalued, say four levels, you know, something like that. Uh, and you know, if, if the Z is coded in a clever way, in the right way, um, we can uh, interpret the valid estimate. Well, we can define actually the valid estimate for level Z and Z minus one of the instrument. So say levels one and zero or two and one or three and two and so on and so forth. In the same way we would define it, you know, always. Um, but when we try to obtain a, like a single causal like a single estimate for, for the cause effect of X on Y, we want to combine all of those uh, together. And you know that's what the sort of conventional methods do. And they do so using a formula such as this, where you just, you know, just take a weighted average of, of, of them according to some weights that I'm not showing how to calculate here. The point is that for the case of multivalued IV, the valid estimate can be interpreted as a weighted average of sort of, you know, you know, sort of level specific kind of, of, uh, of valid estimates. So, and okay, why is that related to, to what we're discussing, right? The reason why this is related to what we have been discussing is that if the effect of X on, on Y is allowed to be nonlinear, then the effect of, of X on Y will also depend on, on Z. Say that Z, you know, higher values of Z only increase the value of, of X, for example. Then we are, if you're looking at, say, the valid estimate that relates to the subgroups one and zero of the instrument, the effect, um, and you know, let, let, let us also say that the effect of X on Y is some sort of, I don't know, some sort of, you know, quadratic or whatever, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Well, quadratic looks fine. You know, if in this subset we have some lower values of Z, then we have lower values of X, then we're going to have lower values of the cause effect. And if you go to, subsets where say say you know z equals four and, and three then the values of x are going to be higher and the cause effects are going to be bigger as well so essentially the cause effect will depend on z and because of that when we take this weighted average unless the weights sort of happen to uh, weight the, the 
sort of level specific vault estimates in such a way that they give you back the average growth effect unless this sort of contract scenario happens you have you just have no guarantee that in general the vault estimate will equal the average cause effect unless you assume that the cause effect of x on y is linear in that case the value of the baseline value of z doesn't matter and they asymptotically are all equal to the average cause effect under the addition of some that we need for now. So take home message if the effect of x on y is, cannot be assumed to be linear in the additive scale. Um, uh, sorry, linear additive, then Nosh is very likely to be to be violent. So then that's the sort of take home message of it. But this, this is like a more of, of, or of a subtle point that the intuition for Nosh that I want you to you know, think about is that idea of independence of individual level cause effects. That's sort of the main sort of intuition for it. And if you dive deeply into it, you're going to arrive at this sort of nonlinearity things. But uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I'd like you to think more about what I've discussed in the case of binary exposures, because that's the, really the intuition for, 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 for this. So just trying to sort of wrap up the presentation. Um, hopefully, people are not so bored. Uh, I mean, I, I, I really wanted that this slide is clear for, for everyone. So I would really like this to be the case. So let's go to each one of those points. We discussed that point identification that is estimating the magnitude and direction of the causal effect requires some form of IV4 assumptions. That is some, some form of assumptions on top of exclusion restriction, independence, and uh, relevance. We saw that the average causal effect can be identified even if both homogeneity assumptions are violated, and that's where Nash shows up. However, we did see that even though Nash is just, you know, by definition, it's, it's at least as plausible as homogeneity, it may not be plausible in some cases, such as where, where the assumed uh, data generating model is not um, linear additive. And for continuous treatments or exposures, um, where the effect of X on Y is unlikely to be linear as well. All right. So we have this assumption, which is Nash, which is weaker than what we previously thought that we needed to identify the average cause effect, but it still has its limitations. So that's the sort of wrap up of the presentation. This is available in this preprint. So if you want to, you know, um, if you don't know what to do of during this, 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 the upcoming strike, you can, uh -huh. uh, you can you know, download it and, and read it. It's also submitted for publication. We are waiting for reviewers to comment on it. Uh, it's been a few years in the making. <laughs> it's, it's, finally, it's finally out in a decent format, hopefully. That's the final slide. I couldn't end my last presentation during this visit in any other way other than showing you the reason why I wake up in the morning every day. My wife and our upcoming son, Davi. Yeah, they're, they're the love of my life and the reason why I'm here today. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions from you or from the audience that are watching us from, uh, from home or whatever they are.